And we're live again for uh, Whale Club Hangout 29. Uh, we're bringing back a guest we haven't had in a long time. It's um, Arthur, uh, the CEO of BitMEX. And then uh, Wally, whose uh, real name is Ben, also from BitMEX, the COO. Uh, today, we'll mostly be covering um, what has changed in the last year since we talked to them, because a lot, a lot has changed with the platform, a lot of very exciting things. Uh, that uh, Flipper and I bitched and moaned uh, to you a year ago, as well as uh, some of their new products coming out, like their A50 uh, China product. So, uh, Arthur and Ben, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us, Vix. Great to be here. All right, Arthur. So, like I said, it's been a little over a year since we last had you on. Uh, why don't you take us through a lot of the changes of uh, of what's happened at BitMEX, and, and more so kind of at the visionary level, because I think when we talked back then, uh, you still guys were very focused on a central clearing party. Um, you know, you had pretty low leverage back then. <laughs> now you guys have some of the uh, largest leverage in the industry. So just tell me the the thought process that went behind all of that kind of pivot. So yeah, basically um, our initial premise when we started BitMEX was uh, we viewed Bitcoin as you know an awesome development and that there was going to be a flood of interest of people using Bitcoin as a commercial tool for payments, uh, remittance, um, trading it as well. And, and these types of traders and individuals would be more on sort of I guess the institutional or, or larger sort of folks. And these people would require um, types of products that were, I guess, more traditional in terms of how they were structured. So something like you would see on the CME or any large a traditional derivatives exchange. And so that's how we built the initial set of products that was BitMEX in uh, early 2015. And as the price, you know, went from you know 400 to 200 and stayed there for the majority of 2015, um, interest in Bitcoin waned uh, in terms of the institutional side, but you saw a lot more people interested in the blockchain, regardless if they knew what that meant or not. It meant that they weren't really interested in trading a new uh, digital currency, which really put a damper on the need for the type of products that we had on our platform. So in the summer of 2015, um, we basically said, well, we're not really trading that much volume on these sort of um, bank-grade Wall Street type products, uh, but there is a very vibrant community of people who like to use Bitcoin as a common form of collateral. So everyone from someone in China, Brazil, America, uh, Europe, they can obtain Bitcoin by selling their domestic currency for Bitcoin, and once they have Bitcoin, they have a whole new world of financial products that they can use. So why don't we leverage this amazing piece of trading technology that we've built uh, and switch towards allowing uh, retail investors to access the global financial markets using Bitcoin. Um, what that usually means is higher leveraged products um, with a lower price point that are easier to understand for your average retail trader. Uh, so we went back to the drawing board uh, and uh, reconfigured some of the uh, um, logic behind the exchange and we uh, released uh, our first highly leveraged products. So we started with um, 10x in July, August of last year and by October of 2015 we had the highest leverage for a Bitcoin traded product of any exchange globally uh, at 100x for our, our daily futures contract. And what we realized is we don't want to stop with Bitcoin because uh, what we saw in 2015 is when the price of Bitcoin doesn't move, Bitcoin traders don't trade Bitcoin. They're trading um, their sports betting. They're trading other financial assets um, because you know the people who are avid Bitcoin traders are avid, avid about the global financial markets, and they want to use Bitcoin to trade other things. And so we want to expand the number of products that allow access to other financial markets. And so... Um, what you're going to see from BitMEX in 2016 is a push towards allowing people access to financial markets that they usually wouldn't have access to because either they don't have enough money um, in terms of the size of their brokerage account or 
what they're offering in their domestic financial markets doesn't allow them to access you know the rest of the world in terms of investment products. And so that's sort of I guess how the vision of how we see Bitcoin and uh, digital currency has changed over the last year. Gotcha. And is it, you know, it, is the 100x product uh, your most popular? I know it's the daily is the most active, but is that is that the product that's seeing the most action? Yes, that's definitely our most popular product at the moment. Um, people like to use the, you know, maximum leverage to scalp small movements. It's great in sideways markets. And in general, you know, most people in Bitcoin have a very short time frame that they'd like to put a position on, and this fits with their trader mentality quite perfectly. Yeah, and do you, you know, I know when we talked like a year ago, you were a little bit, um, you know, kind of self-conscious as far as being presumed as, um, you know, kind of moving towards a, a gambling uh, element and now you are the exchange with the largest leverage. Does that kind of conflict a little bit with uh, kind of your tagline as being a professional exchange? Uh, I mean we're a, a startup so we had a thesis on how we thought the market would evolve. Um, we were incorrect in our thesis and we pivoted and changed. So at the time um, the party line was we're a professional uh, Bitcoin derivatives exchange and that fit with what our view of the future would be for Bitcoin. That unfortunately that doesn't fit with our future view of Bitcoin um, in the next one to two years right now and so we switched to more of uh, a program that is about um, giving people access to the global financial markets on a, a retail investor level. I would add to that that um, although our users may be retail focused we are still you know, banking professionals running a professional grade exchange. Okay, uh, it, we'll get into that a little bit more. It's just, uh, you know, I I know uh, Arthur especially knows that I've been a strong, uh, you know, very vocal as far as saying, you know, we're we're a bunch of degenerate gamblers, and really, if you kind of keep that uh, in mind, you can probably build very successful products and. Um, you know, being that you have the largest leverage in the industry, uh, people took took notice, and um, you're getting uh, use. It's not the only reason. Um, we'll get into the UI UX update, which I was heavily praising Arthur uh, a little bit later in the podcast. Uh, but I guess let, let's let's move into uh, more about this uh, the dynamic profit equalization uh, DPE versus socialized losses. You know what? What's kind of the difference here? Because uh, at least my talk with other people, it feels like it's kind of a rebrand of socialized losses. So what? What? Why do you see it as being different, other than maybe just kind of a few bells and whistles? Uh, so I think the the biggest um, difference for a trader who's um, actively trading these sort of uh, contracts is that you get a real time estimate of what your um, profit adjustment could be. Um, so uh, on some of our competitors, yes, they do show which orders are going to be liquidated, um, and then it would be beholden on you to calculate, okay, what's the total amount of profit that is in the that is subject to an adjustment? How much does the how much do these liquidation orders represent? And they have to sort of make a, a guesstimate as to what that loss um, could be. Whereas um, with BitMEX, uh, we believe we're more transparent with it, and you see a number, and you can adjust your trading strategy in real time based on that number, which represents what if we close a contract right now, what the possible uh, profit adjustment could be. Uh, and then more recently, um, what we've allowed is um, we're the only uh, exchange that offers these sorts of products that actually allows users to withdraw a portion of their realized P&L um, before we rebalance or settle the contract. And basically how that works is if there's not an adjustment um, at the current time, we'll make a decision and say, okay, we'll unlock a, a portion of a, you know, traders' realized profits, and they can either re-leverage that on additional contracts or uh, they can withdraw that to you know, a wallet of their choice. Um, anything you want to add, Ben? Yeah, I would, I would just say that, that on average we target to unlock 
our realized PL subject to availability, and in, in general, we do. We do this um, every eight hours at the end of every uh, trading session. But we, we probably haven't done a great deal to market this. Um, it just, this, this um, margin just magically appears available in someone's account to withdraw or re-leverage, but we, we could do more to, to um, notify or communicate this to the user. But this is, this is unique and sets us apart from other exchanges um, because other exchanges have to withhold 100% of, of realized and unrealized p &L because of the potential for socialized losses. But we're, we're, we're giving users a way to, to make use of this, their profits before that. I gotcha. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't I I like that idea, and I, that's definitely something I haven't heard people kind of you know chat about. Hey, my you know my profit's been unlocked and stuff. So that could be a little bit more of a selling point for people that are concerned with their profits being locked up. But you know, for for more or less, you're you're running a socialized loss system, and I guess that kind of leads into a second question. Is I know you know some some year ago, and lots, lots, a lot has changed, and you've, you've recognized that the uh, business model you first set out on uh, wasn't really um, producing the results you wanted. So why, you know, after the criticism of socialized losses, you know, to make that jump now to socialized losses, you know, what do you have to kind of say to that? I mean, you have have it termed as DPE. I don't think uh, you definitely. You know, most people took a quick look and just realized that socialized losses. So, you know, why why is the socialized loss system so great now? So, I mean, one of the reasons we're able to offer these very highly leveraged products is because we're not actually on the hook um, as an organization. Now, we still do offer um, contracts where we guarantee settlement and you know, those retain the, the leverage, the maximum leverage of um, 5x and have a much more conservative margining system. So we give people a choice. Um, you can trade this product that is guaranteed by BitMEX or you can trade this product that you have possible, the possibility of a profit adjustment. And the results are, you know, there for anyone to see. You know, the 100x product trades, you know, multiples of what our um, guaranteed settlement product trades. And I mean, as a CEO, um, I'm not a priest, I'm a businessman. So while I would have derided socialized losses when the only system that I was running was a guaranteed settlement, of course I had to do that. That's, uh, that's proper business. I wouldn't say that a system is better while trying to convince you to use my exchange that doesn't offer it. So that's, I guess that's how I would counter that. Um, why did you guys change and how do you guys reconcile uh, previous statements to that effect? Well, I'll actually, you know, come to bat for you and say that you you actually have both going on now. So you kind of said, you know what, we still believe in our initial product and there are, you know, uh, our, our people and hedgers that are going to need those guaranteed products and you stuck with that. Uh, you just, you know, you didn't capitulate entirely. You just added the additional you know, product. So I, I do commend you on that. Uh, it just, I just wanted to get a little clarity as far as uh, kind of what what was going on there, because I know it was denounced for a long time, and you know, you've made it clear now. So um, let's let's move a little bit now, uh, kind of deeper into the platform. And um, you know, you talk about initial margin versus maintenance margin, and uh, on 100x, you have to put up. Uh, 1% uh, for the initial margin, and then it becomes uh, half percent on what's effectively 200x. Um, so, you know, like the question really is, is you know, when you hit uh, maintenance margin or fall below that threshold, if I have one BTC, right, and I go all in on what's your 100x contract, at what point of collateral, do I get liquidated? So when you're on that 100 Bitcoin position, uh, when you lose, uh, when, when your equity goes down by half a Bitcoin, so half a percent, that's that's the, uh, the threshold. Uh, and then your position is taken over by the exchange, uh, and then we attempt to liquidate it in the market. Got it. 
I, I think I was a little confused at first, and it's it's coming from a OKCoin okay centric perspective. That you know they they got a lot of flack when they went from uh, ten percent collateral remaining to twenty percent, and I know you're using a different uh, you know calculation for maintenance margin. And uh, you know, initially I was like, oh, half a percent. Well, I mean, I could basically ride this position out to near near zero before you're going to liquidate me. But it seems like I, I had to do a little math to come to this number of uh, fifty percent collateral. Um, and I'm not really opposed to that, especially the fact that you're offering a hundred x product. Um, it's an extremely volatile instrument, and you want to reduce you know, DPE, socialized losses. So, you know, then the kind of question becomes is once you go into liquidation and you, you as an exchange are liquidating this this position, um, where is the salvaged, uh, you know, remaining balance going? Um, I know you, it's kind of in your docs where you're talking about that you do have... Uh, you know, uh, like an insurance fund, but this is where it gets a little unclear as to, you know, where where is this uh, stuff documented where I can see, you know, how much is in the insurance fund and such like that. So yeah, I say we haven't done the best job of um, putting out the exact details of how much is in the insurance fund, uh, but that's mainly because the way our algorithm works in terms of liquidating users, uh, we use whatever is uh, in, um, I guess, excess equity that has been used uh, for prior liquidations to be more aggressive uh, in terms of getting rid of traders' positions who go into a liquidation state, mostly because it's 100 times average. So um, we need to be very aggressive so that we don't have situations where you have uh, large profit adjustments, given that you only have usually less than 24 hours to reverse direction as opposed to a whole week with um, you know the more popular I guess OK coin weekly contracts so you don't get the sort of mean reversion that you would get on a longer dated uh, cycle in terms of rebalancing or or settlement and so what that means is uh, there isn't any money in this insurance fund because when people are liquidated it's an aggressive limit order to get them filled as quickly as possible um, to limit the effect of a runaway market Okay. Um, well, I guess it's still extremely important to us as users to know where that uh, remaining balance is going. Even if the insurance fund is sitting at zero or there's nothing being contributed to it, I think it's extremely important. I mean, you know, at this point, at least as far as the uh, the insurance fund goes, I mean, OKCoin has their page um, where you know, we have to trust them on the data, but we're seeing basically, you know, the adding of Bitcoin over time. And I think... To, wouldn't it be better to, to actually have a transparent accounting process that so goes into an insurance fund, even if the insurance fund is dipped into immediately? You see what I mean? So there would be a balance sheet that you could you could verify against. No, I think we're, we're in agreement on that. We just haven't um, published this, I guess, definitive you know, a line chart like that uh, on the exchange. And that's something that is in our development roadmap because you're not the first people to ask for this information. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I would add to that. I would add that to say that um, in, in general, the, the insurance fund, say, for our, our daily expiring contract is hovers between somewhere between one and two Bitcoin and it gets spent quite quickly when there's liquidation. Um, and the reason that no one has pressed us on this much is because we try and keep the DP rate to zero and the longer we keep it at zero, the less people ask questions. Um, so it, it, generally the proof is in the, the pudding that what people care about is high leverage, liquidity and no no DPE, but it's certainly in our development roadmap to, to provide more transparency on this. Yeah, it, well, that, this is you know this has become a little bit of a concern for me. It it actually kind of uh, tripped me off. I was looking at the Reddit post about UI, and I mean some people know that Flipper and I basically don't get along on 
on much, but uh, I thought he made a really good point about the liquidations, and that's what's kind of led me down this path. And, you know, you guys have had DPE going on since, I don't know, June, July? I know it was sometime last summer when you launched uh, 25X. So, you know, th this is, like, extremely important data as far as... Um, you know, transparency to the users. I mean, we, we have OKCoin OK giving this out. Um, I think wh whether people believe that they're being honest about that, I'm not, I'm not here to say that they are or they aren't, but it's put everything to rest. And, you know, now that you, you guys have disclosed almost everything else as far as you have your settlements page on BitMEX, you have the DPE percentage, you know, since the beginning of time, but you're not posting the insurance fund. So, you know, that, that brings some doubt. And, uh, you know, rightfully so in crypto finance, uh, when people experience doubt, then they start to get skeptical. And they start to ask, well, why has it been taking so long for you guys to post this? Um, and, you know, that that is not something you really want to go down in Bitcoin because Bitcoin Bitcoiners tend to be of kind of the conspiracy theory nature, and it can lead to a lot of crazy things as far as what, what's going on in their head. Um, There's one way to, to solve this, I think. When you put that feature on, I think you should uh, put all the historical data in as well. I think that would be a very good faith effort to show the concerns of BTC VIX there. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Um, you're not the first... Uh, people, persons to ask us for this and it's something that we'll be releasing very shortly. I mean, because, you know, the issue I have is you guys have been, you guys have been really good and uh, you've posted all the other data, but you're basically asking us to trust you on this one. And, you know, like that's, when people are putting money on your exchange, um, you know, they actually, they have a right to be, you know, questioning of why isn't why isn't this part being transparent? I'm not saying some of the ideas they they jump to are necessarily um, the best and well thought out, but I mean they do rightfully so. They should be a bit a bit wary about why why this isn't being transparent when a lot of the other things have been for the net last you know six eight months. No, to fully understand uh, the concerns there. Um, as I said, something that we're going to have live on the exchange very shortly. Yeah, because, uh, <laughs> you know, at least at this this part, you know, like OKCoin okay is being a little bit more transparent uh, than you, at least in regards to this specific thing. Um, and it's important. I mean, you know, where is that collateral going? We, we're trusting you that you are using it for uh, the insurance fund. And you can put all this to rest very quickly by just providing that data. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, do you, do Theo? Do you want to come in here at all? Uh, I don't have any. I think you guys covered the insurance fund well. Um, I don't. What's the next topic? Um, well, I I do think we actually covered a little bit maybe off air about the docs. Um, I know it was just getting a little confusing, and I think you clarified that earlier as far as uh, sometimes you guys do release parts of the uh, locked right. up profits. It's just you guys aren't, you know, kind of advertising that, which I think that's what the doc was confusing me about because I hadn't really heard about it. Yeah, the doc is mainly just to make sure that we keep all the uh, avenues open because, as it says, the, you know, Real process is every week or whenever the contract settles, then we do a profit adjustment if there is one. Um, before that, we may or may not, at our discretion, unlock a portion of realized profits. And if you don't use those realized profits either by buying or selling additional contracts or removing them from the exchange, we retain the right to um, re-lock them back up and use them towards uh, lessening a profit adjustment. And that's basically what the docs are saying. Uh, I know how that, that can sometimes get a little bit uh, convoluted, but we're just trying to lay out um, all this, this, the the options in terms of how this process works. Gotcha. 
All right, I definitely want to move into the uh, UI UX, but before we do that, I wanted to touch a little bit back to, you know, kind of this idea of you, you guys still, you know, uh, call yourselves a professional, you know, professional investors trade Bitcoin derivatives at BitMEX. And, uh, you know, I, I've been doing a lot more observing of the site, admittedly, over the last several weeks compared to a year ago. And I think that's um, kudos to you guys because you guys have come a tremendous way. And I actually, you know, I've been playing around and getting used to the platform. But, you know, there's another thing that uh, is kind of, I don't know, it just kind of makes me feel strange. And, you know, you have the troll box, which I'm not necessarily opposed to. But uh, you have your bot running, your wrecked bot, um, which is cool. Like, it, you're, you're telling the liquidations that are going on. Oh, I'd like but, to point out that that's not um, our uh, BitMEX-owned bot. That's a user created this and is plugged into the Trollbox API and used our public liquidation feed and posting that to the chat. So um, that's not something that we, uh, as a firm, produced. That's okay. a user-generated bot. All right, well, that does make it uh, a little bit different, just because, you know, there's kind of like some taunting in it, um, you know, and I, I guess I was initially under the impression it was coming from you. Um, and, you know, it's it's kind of like the way I see it is you, you know, you walk into a casino, right, and, like, some guy just lost 10 grand on blackjack, and, like, lights and sirens are going off, and you're kind of celebrating his loss. <laughs> and, you know, I know it's not you that are doing it. You can't really control what the users are doing. But, uh, you know, that, that it's just kind of weird. Like, I was just like, what? <laughs> so um, I don't know if anybody else here finds that strange, uh, Theo or Drac. Well, I think it makes more sense now because w- we thought it was from you guys. And we were like, this is kind of weird kind of taunting, but uh, okay, yeah, it's a user-generated thing. I mean, it's a troll box. Anyone can put what they want in there, I guess. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's okay. I mean, it is your troll box, though, so you are allowing that to go on. Um, I don't think I it's... I mean, we're pretty... It's, it's called a troll box for a reason. Yeah. Um, we're not trying to censor... Uh, users in that in that regards, so we've kind of just yeah. But you could of. have some kind of minimum standards that you expect. I mean, if someone started coming in there and be, you know speaking racial slurs or whatever, would you find that acceptable? I mean, even if it's, it's a it's a slippery slope. We're we're trying not to go to that yeah. point. Um, we're, we're not trying right. to come out and say, yeah, oh, you can't say this, you can't say that, because once we start doing that, then our small team is going to be spending our precious bandwidth monitoring what users say in our troll box rather than giving you guys new features. Well, and really that's that's kind of almost yeah. the point is, you know, you go from being exchange operators to community managers, and from where I sit, I can tell you how difficult managing a community can get. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of an element of, you know, a lot of the exchange don't do troll boxes for, you know, some of those, you know, particular reasons even. Um, I don't think that's, I don't really know where I find, fall on the troll box. I just, uh, I think it's just something that, you know, I'm going to read it and other people are going to read it. And if I'm reading it and I'm getting a little bit turned off, I'm sure other people will as well. I, I mean, I say that. It's a matter of scale because if you're, I mean, BitMEX is not a, you know, tremendously popular platform in the sense that, let's say, Trading View is or, you know, some of the other... Yet, things. yet. But, yeah, yet, right? So if you, you know, if, you're, if your user base scales and therefore your Trollbox community scales, then, I mean, you really have to, um, you know, it's not something you can avoid. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's it, look, it's a really interesting topic, but, I mean, at the end of the day, socially, we do have sort of what are considered socially acceptable norms and, and things that are not acceptable. I mean, you know, you can't these days get away with, with certain kind of abuse, you know, verbal abuse. And, I mean, you've just got to, you know, I think you have to have some kind of minimum standards. And it's just, you know, don't be an asshole, don't be a jerk, that sort of stuff. So I, I would say in, in our troll box we do have some basic profanity filters. If you use the F word, it becomes a regex replaced 
become gently caressed and the names of some competitors get obfuscated as well. So we, we try and put a, you know, a basic veneer um, on it. But ultimately, it is laissez-faire. We, we let people innovate with our API because we offer the most extensive API. Um, everything on the front end uses our public API. The Trollbox itself has an API. And we let users innovate. And one of them, the innovations was direct bot as such. And, and now I, I appreciate it can be maybe not particularly... Um, friendly for those who've just been liquidated, other traders use it as a signal because if they see a liquidation order, they know the market's just moved in a certain direction. They know this order is going to be aggressive, aggressed against the book. So it gives them a time to react or to you know, improve or, or disimprove their, their quotes before it's aggressed. Do you have um, the ability to mute a user? That might help. I think it may be implemented. I, I'd have to speak to um, Sam, our CTO, but... Um, there is talk about you know being able to mute individual users, or if not, just you know ignore the whole troll box. Yeah, I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole of uh, community management, but I I will echo that there is no doubt that that data, as far as liquidations go, is of of extreme value. I mean, you know, many of us here know know Nomad, who started the the OKCoin OK uh, liquidation Twitter bot. And, uh, you know, I have, that's one of the few ones that I have selected that anytime it tweets, um, it notifies me on my phone. And I'll be, I don't know, anywhere getting coffee and all of a sudden my phone will start going crazy. And I know, you know, without, without even looking at a chart that there's one of those kind of, you know, ashtray sage candles, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> something crazy has, has gone on before I, even, before I even look at it, so... Um, yeah, I just I was just a little bit uh, kind of looking at it in the context of what was what was written around it, and like I said, I didn't know that was was your bot um, or it, that it wasn't your bot, but still you do control you know what is said in there, and you know people getting some people are those orders, and maybe that turns them off and turns them away. I don't know, uh, just kind of an observation more than anything. I'd say the more what we've gotten more of the troll boxes, I think we found that people have been quite behaved more than we would have thought, and that it's become more of a customer support venue more than people being trolls. Um, you know, people will come on and say, "Hey, I'm new. I got a question," and before um, one of us can actually you know respond to them, there's another user who's knowledgeable because they've been on the platform for some time is able to answer their question in an intelligent manner. And I found that the majority of comments and uh, uh, language is around um, financial products and uh, trading and helping other people rather than just being an asshole. So uh, I would point that out as well about you know this troll box community that we've had that we've built on the platform. Yeah, I, uh, I'm I'm with you there. Uh, I think that does provide also. You know, uh, especially in the early days of BitMEX when people would come on and kind of be like, you know, what in the hell am I looking at? And they could kind of get guided through that on the troll box. But, but you know, new people are coming in all the time to trade uh, financial products, and they'll find themselves on there. And uh, if you don't have a troll box, you, you don't know, you know, what kind of feedback is coming directly from them because they may just log out and never log back in. So I, there's certainly a utilization for it. It's just more of an observation of some of the things that was going on in it. Yeah, we certainly do have very good engagement with our customers through the troll box. I think one thing BitMix is noted for is being approachable, that they can just literally message us immediately, suggest features, we listen, we'll fix it, we'll even do support requests straight in the, the troll box. And I think that sets us apart from a lot of our competitors who maybe you don't even know who who's behind them, you don't know if they're listening. Um, and so we, we, we want to keep that that connection with, with our users. Yeah, I, but do also know that sometimes the users may not interpret some of the, uh, what, what does it say, like uh, traders are extremely vindictive bunch of people, like, you know, uh, they're, they're very easy to just kind of troll as far as like, oh, how'd that, uh, you know, the market's up today, even though you know, like, the guy's been short the whole week, right? You're just kind of 
making fun of them. So that some people might not get that kind of humor that's going on on the troll box. It's certainly a part of culture that uh, I consider myself a part of. But you know, maybe other users that uh, you know, it might question. It kind of questions some of the the branding of being a kind of a professional exchange and you know, wrecked and chop suey and you know, blood in the streets kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know if that really aligns. It's just kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, that's a fair, fair point. Um, I'm sure as we grow, we'll have to deal with these issues more and more. All right. So let's let's move on to you know the big the big launch recently, which is kind of the the UI UX rollout. So uh, Wally, do you want to take us through that? I'm I'm not sure if you want to put a screen up or if you want me to put mine up. Uh, yeah, I, I can't share a, a screen at the moment, but if if you could put yours up, that'd be great. Yeah, let me let me do this here. All right. So we so we we spent some time with uh, user interface designer to try and simplify the user interface and the user experience because one of the the most common pieces of feedback we got from users was. Bitmex looks great. It looks professional, but it's too complicated. It's it's overwhelming. There's too many options. I don't know what these means, um, and it put people off. And and coming from a banking background, we we built Bitmex to look like a Bloomberg trading screen. Yeah, you know, it, it 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 was a product built by professionals for professionals. And so what we've tried to do with this user interface is to to focus it more towards the retail market. Um, to make it, it, it simpler to understand, but with still retaining all the power and professionalism of the, the BitMEX exchange. So um, straight away, the main page shows you the trading screen, and we split off into a sidebar, the order control box. So we try to keep that, keep that in one place. It's now expandable, collapsible. You can expand the position uh, widget, the contract details widget, and then we've constructed a tab, tab-based uh, instrument selector, so you can very quickly choose Bitcoin or Ethereum or China A50, and then as a sub-selection, the, um, ex- the different monthly or weekly expiries. Um, part of the, the user interface redesign was to support new features, so we now support market orders, limit orders, stop uh, stop orders, and stop limit orders, and various sub features to these. For example, we support hidden orders, so you can you can submit a limit order that doesn't appear in the order book. This is where you may want to to build up a position without giving away or showing your full hand. And for market makers, <clears throat> because we have a um, a fee model that's maker taker, meaning that if you if you take liquidity, you pay 7.5 basis points. But if you if you post liquidity, if you post a passive limit order and it gets filled, you get a rebate of 2.5 basis points. Because of this this maker taker model, we've now added a post only flag, so you can you can place an order uh, with a post only flag, meaning that it it will it will not pay the taker fee. So if 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 um, it's going to aggress against the order book. It will get cancelled instead. So this this gives people confidence to place many orders in the book, knowing that they'll always get the rebate. And another uh, feature we've added recently has been to offer customized leverage. So originally, when we started, we offered the maximum leverage of the product, say 100x, and then we offered a, offered a toggle between 100x and cross margin. So Either it was 1% at risk or your whole margin balance at risk and nothing nothing really in between. So one of the new new innovations of the engine but also the front end is to be provide is to provide custom leverage. So you'll see on the left hand side under the, the position sidebar you can literally drag the slider anywhere from uh, one times leverage to five times, ten times, twenty times, or a hundred times leverage. And this lets the user choose before they even open the position exactly where they want their liquidation price to be. They can choose choose how much margin is going to be at risk. And of course, we still support cross-margin, which is effectively the least amount of leverage on, on the far left. 
we then provide a dynamic kind of on this rainbow chart we provide a dynamic indicator of of how much leverage their position is using so as a position moves against you as you're getting close to liquidation you'll see you'll see that that indicator move say from 100x when you enter the position to 150 170 to 200 and 200x or half a percent maintenance margin is the liquidation point and so you can you can visually see at any time how close you are to liquidation and then you can either adjust your position moving to cross margin or you can you can add more margin manually uh, to the position then um, we've also kind of simplified the layout of the uh, the, the, the uh, trading screen we show the chart now front and center um, uh, we're also going to add charting for the underlying index price as well which which we think will help people with technical analysis to have the full trading view uh, set of indicators they can add to the underlying index price which in this case comes from trading view and then all the standard controls uh, we've got the, the, the recent trades chart margin chart active orders positions etc um, but this this user interface we design is just a start of a, a variety of changes we're making to support additional order types so we're soon going to be all uh, adding support for trailing stops so you'll be able to place a, a stop order that that's pegged say five dollars below the mark price so you can say I'll give this 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 stop sell order five dollars of movement and as the price rises, say the, the 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 stop trigger price rises, also it ratchets up. But as once the market has dropped five dollars from that point, the the position's closed out. We're also going to start adding um, OCO orders, so one cancels the other. This is where you could place, say, two orders. You could place a, a sell limit order to to take profit and a stop sell order to to uh, cut your losses. These two orders could be linked via OCO, meaning that if one of them executes, it cancels the other. And this is important if you want to exit a position but only want one of your uh, exits, only want one of the orders to execute. Otherwise, you might end up with double execution and uh, the inverse position. We've also got support for OTO orders coming. This is one triggers the other. So you may place, say, a a bid say at 400 and when this is filled it automatically you could trigger an order to be automatically placed to sell say a limit order at, at 420 or whatever your target price is so we're really trying to bring a lot of the advanced features you may be used to in, in retail FX or from, from uh, retail brokers onto our platform but provided directly uh, directly by the exchange um, and I, I think Arthur should give us a, give a talk a bit more about some of our new order, um, some of our new instruments, for example, uh, the A50. Yeah, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. I just wanted to really compliment you on this uh, this sidebar here. I, I'm like almost in love with it. Um, this is everything that I've been looking for as far as um, you know where you guys were going to go. Because I, I even remember you know talking to Arthur quite a while ago in this the contract details before was like in this area up here and it was static and it was like a paragraph of what the contract was and I just I just kind of told Arthur like you know you need to make this very intuitive visually where you know like at a quick glance even with that paragraph that supposedly described the whole contract and everything this quick glance method here like I understand immediately and I already I already get it and uh, yeah this is this is great um, you guys did a good job. So I guess then we'll move into the, uh, you're offering a new product now, this uh, China A50. Um, and, you know, it, just let me get the term right. It's technically the SGX China A50 futures. That is what's... So so the okay, that's, I'm, this is a it's a little bit confusing, but so the the underlying index is the FTSE China A50 index, and basically what this index is is the 50 biggest com uh, companies in China by market capitalization uh, on the Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and generally what you'll find is the um, China A50 index is majority financials, so banks, insurance companies and uh, real estate developers. 
as opposed to the CSI 300 or the uh, Shanghai Composite, which is a more a, a broader based index of uh, of com of companies. Um, so sort of kind of like a uh, imagine the FTSE 250 is like the Dow Jones, and then S and P 500 is CSI 300. Gotcha. Um, and so the reason why we chose this particular index is because um, the only futures contracts, forgetting about um, Bitcoin, the only futures contract that a non-Chinese investor can trade in the world is listed in Singapore. And this contract is on the FTSE uh, China A50 index. And it's a US dollar uh, quanto futures contract, which basically means it's a US dollar multiplier applied to a CNY index price. And the SGX launched this futures contract about five or six years ago. I remember trading it when it first came out. And over, the t over time, as China's um, market has become more and more important in terms of the global s scheme of things, this contract has gotten more and more liquid and stands today as the SGX's most successful product that they've ever launched. And so basically, what we thought was, OK, well, if you want to trade this contract, about one contract's worth notionally about 10,000 US dollars. So you and you're uh, usually you get around I think eight times uh, leverage on this product. So you need somewhere between one one and a half thousand U.S. dollars of initial margin to trade this product. Then you need a brokerage account that lets you trade futures contracts in Singapore. So right away we've basically stripped away um, access to a majority of people in the world to trade a leveraged product on China. And so uh, what we thought was, well, why don't we um, give Bitcoin, people with Bitcoin, the ability to trade in a small notional size on China with very, very high leverage. And so no matter where you are in the world, you can have access to the China equity market, which right now is one of the most important and one of the most volatile markets in, in the world today. So yeah. with our product, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to kind of, you know, you're going down that path of, you know, why why should Bitcoiners care? I mean, there might be some people that are just in Bitcoin, trading Bitcoin, that are completely oblivious to what else is going on in the world. I mean, why should why should they, you know, want to trade this product? And then, you know, the I think the other important thing is uh, you're running into some marketing issues as far as you know, trying to say the SGX China A50 futures product pretty much so lost, you know, you know, all but five people on the hundred thousand plus subreddit of our Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, like they're they're not even knowing what that is. But you you say, you know, you take like a clip of YouTube with Donald Trump saying China, 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 China. You know, you want to short China? You want to trade China? Well, that's this is how you do it. So. Yeah, so I mean, the, I guess, marketing for people who uh, are just, they, they have a, a view on China and they want to trade it with leverage, this is the product, regardless of the, the mechanics of it. If you have Bitcoin, you can trade with 25 times leverage on a China stock, on the China stock market, and that is this product. Now, if you want to understand why we're able to get liquidity on this product and why there are market makers willing to quote on this product, then the document you have up here um, you'll read into more detail about why we basically structured it to mimic what is on the Singapore Stock Exchange because, in effect, you can pretty much hedge one-to-one -one using that futures contract versus a BitMix futures contract and, in, and basically bootstrap liquidity onto the product. And that's sort of the, me uh, sort of the me more mechanics issue around why we've done what we've done with, with the contract structure if you're interested in learning more about that or if you're interested in actually market making this product because we do offer a very generous rebate of uh, 10 basis points for um, passive maker orders uh, on our on the China A50 product. But the overarching your, theme is... Oh, go ahead, Ben. So I was going to say, to answer your question of why would a Bitcoin trader want to trade this product, well, I, I would actually turn it on its head in that this product is a reason for someone, a retail trader, to go and buy some Bitcoin, that this product gives them access to the Chinese market with 25 times leverage that they're not going to find anywhere else in the world. This is an incentive to, to buy Bitcoin, become maybe a, a Bitcoin trader because, because of what it offers. 
Well, I, I'm I'm gonna have a little contention with that because I think it's a there's a chicken and egg problem here. Where I mean, even Arthur earlier in this hangout said, you know, when Bitcoin traders aren't trading Bitcoin, you know, they're off on a CFD broker, they're trading other products. So, to me, you know, I I actually really understand what you're saying because it's it's extremely true that uh, you know the West largely has very limited to no access to uh, the Chinese market and exposure to it. So you're offering that. But I think if you go about trying to sell it that way, you're going to find that it's you're not going to get much traction. The more important way is to go from the Bitcoin traders that are already on your platform or Ethereum traders you know, or just Bitcoin traders in general to get them using it. So that is actually the more important uh, element to at least get your, you know, product to, you know, minimal uh, viability, in my opinion. Um, does that make some sense? Well, yeah, I mean, we have, if you have Bitcoin on, on BitMEX, you have, you know, three types of things you can trade right now. You can trade Bitcoin, you can trade Ethereum, you can trade China. Um, when one thing is more popular or there's you know more news around one particular area, then more people gravitate towards that product. Um, but we want to start that process because it is a hard process to introduce a completely new type of product to um, the market um, by with a very I guess a more salient story. Everyone knows that China is important. Everyone knows that the Chinese market has been practically imploding over the last eight months. So here's a product that lets you either play the rebound or play the continued collapse in, in the Chinese economy, um, right? So it's a good story around this product where we can start to get people interested to at least educate themselves on how a product of this type would work. Once you make this successful, then, you know, we have a lot more options in the types of products that we can list and the types of underlyings that people can now trade on Bitfex. Yeah, and, you know, I'll just kind of, I'm going to throw this over to Theo because we were discussing some of, some of these uh, some of these concepts earlier, but yeah, the idea though initially is you you have done a good job of bringing you know Bitcoin traders that love high leverage, I will say, over to your platform and they're using it regularly. Uh, the idea then is to be like, hey, you know, guys, Bitcoin isn't trading or sorry, isn't moving as much. You know, we have this other product, but you know how you go about doing that really determines you know, what kind of traction you're going to get in it. And I want to bring Theo in. Uh, Theo, what, what ideas did we come up with? Hi, guys. Yeah, I also want to say good job on the uh, new design of the uh, of the UX. It's much easier to use, I think, for people and uh, and easier, easier for them to understand. And, uh, you know, related to that, I was, you know, looking at my um, referrals and I was thinking, how can I, I don't know who these people are, how can I get in touch with them and tell them, I know you guys have a newsletter, but how can I say, hey, why don't, I would like to be able to say, hey, I'll give you 10 contracts of the A50 and you guys go try it out and if you, you know, are able to trade it like three times, well, then you can keep that, that little bit of money. So, you know, just like a, kind of like a bonus system for hey why don't you come try this out this new this new product here are you know five or ten contracts or whatever and you know if you guys can trade it three times then you know you can keep it but at least you tried it out I know you do give a 10 percent discount on fees and that's cool um, but yeah just like a kind of uh, I would like to be able to reach out to the people I referred and say hey check out the new it's newly designed it looks like maybe you didn't trade at all before you know, uh, so why don't you come now and trade? And you know, and by the way, we'll give you a few contracts to play around with. For, and for example, like Ethereum, I think a lot of the people um, that are into Ethereum uh, maybe might not be the most experienced traders, but they they notice, hey, Bitmex has this you know leveraged Ethereum. It's the highest leveraged Ethereum product. Um, that looks interesting, but I don't really know what to do. So I think they kind of need like a little, I don't know, something to kind of get them going, a little, a little more helping hand to get them going. I mean, if for for people that already trade Bitcoin, I think that uh, the platform's great, the way the changes are. But I think for 
maybe some older users that to kind of get them active again, or maybe some old users that didn't try it, um, like a kind of bonus. Uh, the idea was, yeah, to give them a few contracts. Okay, that's uh, it's what almost like a demo account, like we, in, instead of giving you ten dollars or giving you like right exactly uh, whatever Bitcoin to go and play around with. Exactly, exactly. Say, hey, uh, come trade the crashing Chinese stock market. If you sign up, you get 10 free contracts. If you trade them three times, you can keep it or something like that. And uh, I don't know. I think that's that might get – I might even get more Bitcoin traders interested in trying something that's not uh, you know, crypto, for example. It's just an oh, yeah. idea we had. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was just going to weigh in there and, you know – Arthur, it it was a year ago where I told you, you know, a lot of the a lot of your clients or the type of people you're gonna find are gonna be of a genetic makeup that is a degenerate gambler. So I I know it's probably not what you want to hear, but you know, a lot of this is very kind of casino 101, where you know what. Let's say you want to get this the A50 product. Uh, some activity on it. I mean, I'm looking at it right now. Um, there's been, I don't know if this is on my local time. If it's 5 o'clock local time, that's been, you know, six hours ago there was two trades, and then we got to go back another four hours. So I understand you just launched this. We're getting uh, people up to speed on it, but let's think about this once. Why not do a promotional offer that includes either a minimal deposit match for new people where their deposit match, in order to unlock it, they have to trade some notional value on the A50 product. You know, that's one way to get people interested. And then for your current customers, you could offer, you know, a, another promotion that maybe is something similar where they can make a deposit and unlock it via trading that product. You know, that's that's really what you want to, you know, to trade off, right? Because what incentive do I have, you know, it's just a trader right now or a trader that's sitting on the platform to do any testing on the A50 product. I don't really have much incentive, but if you give me a deposit bonus and now you say, well, you need to make, I don't know this, I'm not going to come up with uh, the specifics on it. You know, it, you know in, in poker, in online poker, they make you pay you know, 50 hands before you can withdraw your deposit bonus. But in this element, it'd be trade orientated at the products that you're trying to get off the ground. Does that make some sense? Yeah, I think that that's a, a good suggestion. It makes a lot of sense. Theo, do you want to add to that as my my? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, guy? I. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I agree with you. It just gets pe you know people that are curious. Uh, in the door and you know lets them try it out. That's all. Uh, I agree pretty much with Fix that uh, you know you see that element in uh, poker or sports betting and all that kind of stuff too. But uh, you also see you know forex broke CFD dealers offering really similar stuff. So I think it's pretty common. And I think um, yeah, it could be a new thing in the uh, Bitcoin in the Bitcoin world that I haven't seen yet. I actually think Ethereum would explode. You know, as far as interest goes, if you offered something similar to this, because I mean, the ETH Trader subreddit is, you know, it's it's a lot of times more active than, uh, you know, our Bitcoin at times, as far as how quickly they're posting and getting uh, information out. Yeah, if you want to get people onto your platform, I would very much take advantage of this alt, you know, alts are back bubble. Definitely play on that. I mean, Ethereum has brilliant liquidity and there's so much activity. Yeah, I mean, we're very surprised that, I mean, we're not, we don't have Poloniex style volume yet, but, you know, we're doing close to a thousand Bitcoin a day on RNI Ethereum futures. So these are great, some great ideas and how we can, you know, accelerate that and get ourselves, you know, the most liquid product for trading Ethereum. And especially, you only need Bitcoin, you don't have to touch Ethereum as an, as an altcoin to get involved. All right. Um, does anybody else have anything? I think, uh, Theo, do you have anything additional to add or drag? Uh, no, thanks a lot for coming. And, uh, you know, I think you answered everything and glad to hear about the trailing orders and the OCO and all that coming up. Good job.
Yeah, I'm I'm really really impressed. I mean, I, I confess I haven't actually used Bitmex um, because of the reasons Vix enunciated a little earlier. You know, it was just like, whoa, this is too complex. Um, but uh, I love the features. I love the uh, the OTO that you're going to bring. Um, that's something I think we should have everywhere. So yeah, uh, I think I'm going to give your platform a try. Cool. And uh, you know, Arthur, Wally, did we miss anything that uh, you wanted to cover? And um, yes, just one last thing. Um, sure. So we just launched a 48-hour, 100 times leverage contract on Monday, and um, basically what this contract does is ev it's a two-day contract, but every 24 hours it becomes a daily contract. So it's a great way for people who want to um, roll their positions day to day uh, on the daily contract instead of having to every you know day at 12 GMT when it expires, they have to rebuy or resell into the market. They can use this two-day contract to manage their exposure over the settlement period. And so we're hoping that this is going to help a lot of our market makers um, increase the amount of size that they quote on the daily and the two-day contract. So I hope that people will come and try that out. Can I ask just a quick thing? Doesn't need a big answer. What's your KYC AML policy at the moment? Uh, so right now, um, as I think we've been pretty vocal, we don't accept uh, any U.S. Um, persons on our platform um, for regulatory reasons. I won't go into how we determine whether or not you are a U.S. person, but that is sort of the most salient, uh, I guess KYC aspects, and then other than that, we require a, a valid email address and Bitcoin. I like it, and no plans to change it by the sound of it. Uh, at the moment, no. Good on you. Good. All right, and then Wally, do you have anything uh, to finish up with? Um, I'll just say watch this space because we've done a lot of work in the back end on the engine to support OCO orders and OTO orders. Um, and so it's just a question of rolling these out on the front end, uh, which takes a lot of work of, of testing and building and, and user acceptance. Um, but yeah, just watch this space, and, and we're sure you're going to love these these features as they appear on the front end. All right, and uh, you can find the guys of Bitmax over um, bitmax.com. Uh, they also frequent the. Um, uh, the Reddit's uh, uh, Twitter at bitmex.com. Uh, thanks, thanks for uh, coming on, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks for having us.